definitely have to separate training from teaching. Hello, this is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 488, with today's guest, Mr. Peter Sorcy. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, show host and Whistlekick founder, and everything we're doing at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we do, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you'll find everything we're doing. It's also the easiest place to find our products, the stuff we make, because we don't just make podcasts. We make sparring equipment and uniforms and lots of really fun apparel, great stuff. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you can save 15% off everything that's over there. This show has a separate website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And we're bringing you a new episode twice a week. The goal of the show and of Whistlekick overall, it's all under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to help guarantee future episodes of the show, there are lots of ways you can do that. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media, tell a friend, pick up a book. Leave a review or support the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick is the place to go for that. You can support us monthly with as little as $2, but if you contribute $5 or more, we're going to give you more. More written content, more audio content, more video content, just more. Who doesn't want more? We're in an interesting time for martial arts as more and more practitioners are cross-training. People training in multiple disciplines, finding ways to connect them. And quite often, those connections become a new style. Well, not today. Today's guest teaches the things that he knows independently, and he has reasons for it. And we talk about that. We talk about his past. We talk about a lot. So hang on as we hear from Mr. Peter Sorcy. Well, it's a martial arts show, and we usually start in a pretty obvious way in that I ask the guest, I mean, you... you if you've listened to a dozen episodes, you've certainly heard me ask this at least 10 times. How did you get started? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, I, was, I was six years old, and I, I remember this really, really well. Um, we were at a festival in Milwaukee. It's called Summerfest. And there was this martial art demonstration going on. And I thought it was the coolest thing I've ever seen. And then at the very end, it was mostly adults, but at the end, they brought out a, a child. And I just fell in love with it. And my parents heard the other message. They heard focus, respect, discipline. And they're like, oh, my God, we should look into this. And what was really cool is I have an um, abnormality in my hands where it's kind of hard to explain over the phone. But if you put your hands out and then you go to flip them over, like palm up, like to get a, you know, for someone to give you five, mm -hmm. my hands don't fully rotate. They only turn to 90 degrees. Oh. And it's just the way I was born. And uh, so what that means is other sports like throwing and baseball and basketball, I didn't, um, they were uh, more challenging for me. And then the other thing is I had asthma pretty severe um, to the point where if I went outside and I ran around with my friends in the yard for 30 minutes, I'd be in a full-blown asthma attack. I need my inhaler. So martial arts was an indoor activity. And we could modify it, you know, make it work for me, even though I couldn't do, you know, all the proper chambers and everything perfectly. It didn't matter. I just did what I could. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And then never uh, stop. I mean, I, it's a love that, you know, boy, I started in 82. So we're looking at almost 38 years and I'm like still passionate about it. My wife gives me a hard time because she says it's the martial art channel 24 hours, seven <laughs> days a week. Uh, there, there are there are a lot of spouses that I think have uh, have endured that. I mean, the, the best solution is to bring them in and, and get them training, right? Yeah, you know, she did a, a round earlier with uh, Taekwondo, and you know, she stuck with it. She got her green belt, but didn't really love it. And then um, a couple years ago, she started training in the, our Filipino martial arts program, and she's sticking with that. And she really likes it, so she likes it. It's a little more. Um, um, obviously practical, you know, there's mm. not the forms, there's not the other um, aspects. It's, you know, more like right here and there, you know? Yeah. So, but yeah. Do you teach her or do you have someone else teach her? I, well, I do, but I'm at a distance. So I, you know, I own and operate a school and then I have several other instructors 
Um, when it comes time for like one-on-one stuff, I, I, I try to sit back a little bit, but you know, she'll be in the class with everyone. And then um, it works better if I have other people kind of work with her, but absolutely we do too. And she does a nice job. It's, it's, you know, it's a challenge, you know, and I have to realize that <laughs> yeah. working with your, uh, you know, your spouse, you know? Yeah. We've talked about that on the, on the show a number of times, people training with family members. It doesn't even have to be a spouse. You know, mm-hmm. one of the challenges I had growing up was that I outranked my mother and that was a, that was a challenge for us, you know, both ways, you know, just trying to understand, you know, that dynamic flips the moment you bow in versus you bow out, you know, it's a completely different thing. And, and, you know, it sounds like you certainly recognize it and you're trying to, to um, not create any difficulties for your personal relationship. <laughs> right. Yeah. It was hard at first because before class, well, show me a few things before class, before she started. And that was kind of hard because mm-hmm. it's like, all right, how are you doing a nice job? You're doing a great job, honey. And then, all right, now let's do this. And she'd get, kind of get frustrated. So it was actually better once she was in the room with everybody else, you know. I, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> now you have more than one martial arts program going on in that school, if I if I understood I, what you what you've got going correctly. I do, yeah. yeah. Um you know, for me it was like taekwondo for uh hardcore you know, for the first 15 years or so, and it was almost to a detriment where I would defend it at every corner, you know, where people would say, well, Taekwondo's no good, you you know, this art's better and that art's better. I'm like, you know, the way I learned it, we incorporated self-defense, we incorporated um, a lot of other things, and if you really train it, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a good martial art that encompasses many areas and what most people are exposed to. And then um, um, I slowly started you know, interacting with different people and, and learning little stuff here and there. And then uh, eventually um, went in full bore um, into uh, uh, Anaya Nascrima and then also Donzanu Jiu-Jitsu. And then so in my school today, I have three distinct programs. So, I, you know, I think it's cool. A lot of people, they make a blend. I think that's great. But sometimes when you create a blend, I feel you miss out on certain things. Um, so I'm, I'm a proponent of teach the entire art of Taekwondo, teach the entire art of Donzhu, teach the entire art of Eskrima, you know, and then people can kind of assimilate and become their own martial artists rather than, all right, we're going to just do these 10 drills from Eskrima and only these five throws from Judo and these five locks, you know, because you think lock number 18 is useless. Mm, I still teach it, you know, because depending on the circumstance and if you know it well enough, you know, that it might, might come out, you know? So that's kind of my overall philosophy Mm. that way. And and it's interesting. You, you addressed it head on and and this is where I was going to go was that you have some schools that teach the different martial arts as distinct programs and you have others that blend them. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm sure you would agree. There is a, there is some benefit to doing it both ways, you know, and there's certainly, there are, uh, there is a downside to doing it both ways, and obviously you've done the way that that you think is is best for you, for you and for the, what you want to teach and how you want to teach it. But how did you get there? How did you arrive at having three different distinct martial arts programs that you wanted to share? Yeah, you know, I, I guess it happened kind of organically. You know, I had the one program, and then um, as I, you know, earn, you know. Uh, credentials in, in the, the Eskrima, you know, I just slowly started out a separate class, like one day a week or a seminar, you know, started out actually with a seminar here and there, and then started out one night a week. And then it, you know, eventually it grown. And originally I was teaching through, uh, uh, you know, like, like how most people start, you teach through basically a community center. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so you had your full-time job, and then run to school at night. And then, um, you know, eventually make the leap. So the Screamer kind of started then. It was part-time. And um, it kind of just organically morphed where, all right, I think I'm ready for a second class. All right, I'm ready for a third class. Oh, now I need an advanced class. We have so many practitioners in this art, and it just kind of worked out. And then for the jujitsu, um, because, you know, we do some takedowns and, 
um, things in our Taekwondo programming, not, not extensively. And then there is quite a bit in the Filipino arts. So Don's new program, I do one day a week. It's meant to be a compliment. So it's like, you know, you're already training in something and you want to get better at your throws. You want to, you want to really concentrate on that. And then we, we have that. Um, it's kind of like a part-time program. Mm. Yeah. What, what was your, uh, your day job prior to going full-time? Oh, with this? yeah. I was an electrical engineer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's, and uh, and how long how long did you do that? Oh boy, I did that for six years. So what happened was I was in college and started the community program. And you know your parents, I'm sure a lot of people hear this. My parents love them to death, but they're like, you know what, you need a real job. You can't be a martial <laughs> arts teacher. Um, when I was a little kid, I, I, and I tell this story um, regularly, whenever there was a vacant storefront. I'm talking when I was like 11, 12 years old. I'd look in the window. I'd count the ceiling tiles. I'd go home and lay out a stool on graph paper. And I must have done this two, three dozen times. And then, you know, my instructor had a successful school, but we knew some people that branched off. They tried to open a school. And what happened was uh, they didn't make it. You know, so my parents said, you need a job, you need a steady paycheck, you need insurance, you need this and that. So I went the engineering route, and um, I was miserable. And then I started to learn about the business side of things, and I said, you know what, I got to do this. So I did one year um, uh, full-time engineering and full-time school, and at the same time, I had just gone through a divorce. I was living with my parents. So 28 years old, living with mom and dad. Oh man, yeah, it's interesting. I love hearing people's stories. So, like, I went back and I listened to your old podcast um, where you were interviewed. I just love that yeah. stuff because that's how you get to know people. You know, it is, and that's that's part of why we did that episode. Was people kept asking me, you know, what about you? What about you? What about you? And it was funny because it, I was really uncomfortable being on that side of the mic. You know, sure. on the on this side, it's easy. You know, I don't have to be vulnerable. I don't have to answer these questions and I can just, you know, poke at other people and see what shows up, but to be on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. So 28 living with your parents, you've got all this flux, all this chaos in a sense happening in your life. What was that? like? What was that like emotionally? And how did that impact your training or how did your training impact that? Yeah. Um, Boy, I, I guess I was just running, running ragged, you know, because, um, you know, full time school, I would literally leave work I had a 30 minute drive. To the, I'd go right to the studio, you know, try to open the doors 30 minutes before the first class. You know, hopefully traffic was good. And then, um, you know, enrolled every student, enroll, you know, made every phone call, basically, you know, taught almost every class. I had some help from the rec program. You know, I'd, I'd get some coverage here and there. And um, I tell you where the, where the harp, that wasn't so bad because I didn't have time to stop and think um, or react. Um, but I tell you when it did happen, it happened. The struggle was when I quit my engineering job and the school was like paying its bills and I had saved enough money to, to live off of for a little while. I'm like, I'm going all in. And that's when it hit me because about six months after that, I'm like, why don't I have all this work done? Because I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, oh, once I quit my engineering job, I'm going to, you know, I'll get my billing set up. I'll, I'll, you know, my website will do this, 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 this. You know, there's like a million tasks when you're running a school to do it correctly. And I was like six months in and I barely put a dent into all these projects. And I thought I'd be done with them all. And I was really struggling. And, and I was really fortunate that my, um, my now wife, you know, Rachel, she says, uh, um, you know, I think you're depressed. And I'm, I looked at her like, there's no way. Yeah, I think you are. And then she kind of explained. Um, and I can't remember exactly what she said, but she says, yeah, well, sometimes this happens when it's, you know, it shows itself th- this way and that way. And I'm like, really? There's no way. I'm like, all right. Um, went to bed that night, woke up the next morning, and I was like a new person. Um, just that discussion, like recognizing, you know, things were not working right in my brain. 
um, it kind of relaxed me, calmed me down, and I was able to, you know, focus and get back on track, you know. Mm. Mm. But uh, I tell you, I mean, I know everyone has a story, but, man, I mean, the first time I opened the school, I literally took my life savings. I had 30 grand in the bank, built out the school. My bank account was empty. Now, the engineering job had things going, right? But then I saved maybe 25 grand that year. And so this is what I'm going to live off of. And then the school started to make a little bit. But then as soon as it was doing well, I, I, I wanted to, I needed to expand. So at that point, took out another business loan, <laughs> expanded, you know, and then, you know, we've done this like three times now. And, I, you know, I don't think people realize that they look at a school and they see, you know, a large facility with staff and, um, you know, beautiful place and uh, they think oh my god this guy is you know wow must be nice you know, i have heard that like oh okay thanks man <laughs> like yeah, it's as easy to um uh, uh, like it just fell in your lap like you just open a karate school and now you're going to make six figures overnight i mean it's just ridiculous um but yeah it takes time you know it does it does were any of the schools or the expansions or the layouts were, were any of those predicted in the drawings from younger you <laughs> um similar man similar really it oh, was cool. hilarious well, well there's only still things you do a wall you know you need a mat a changing room and bathrooms and office right um there were some challenges with the building because the building i have is well over 100 years old so there was a lot of challenges with holes and walls that couldn't be moved and stuff um but um no, there's a lot of similarities. The biggest difference is back in the day, I, I thought every school had to have a locker room. And now I realize that's a bad idea with kids and adults. You should have individual changing rooms. So that's probably the biggest difference, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame that we have to think about those sorts of things, especially in uh, martial arts schools. You would think that, no, this is a place we don't have to sweat that, but we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. scary thing, you know? It is. It is. It's, uh, it's just part of the world that we live in today though so 15 years of taekwondo and you know i i, I kind of I, I was struck by the way you talked about it that you were defending it i think you defended it to you used the word corners in there so i'm imagining you that that you're having some intense discussion with people at times about the advantages of one art versus another and i'm curious for you to step into another art, I mean, if you were really defensive of Taekwondo, something happened. Something in the armor cracked. Yeah. I'll and tell you, you said, yeah. there's more, or there's another, not necessarily a better way, but there is another way that warrants some exploration. What, what happened? Yeah. So I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. Yeah, it was please. to the point where um, I was defending Taekwondo to the point where this was like, I remember like websites. So when I started college, it was like only green screen stuff. And then, and then all of a sudden the internet came out and you'd have to wait for a picture to load way back then. I made, I don't know what you call a blog now. And it was a rant. I wish I kept it. I wish I had this, but it was a rant about just martial arts and like, um, you know, about McDojo's and about kids getting their black belts and, and it was basically, I'd have a question, then I would just rant for five, six paragraphs. And, and um, one, of the, one of the biggest topics in there was just, you know, defending Taekwondo. Because, um, you know, I just believe so strongly in it. Like, if you really train it well, you're good at it. You got it. And then um, what happened is, I did believe in cross-training, but I felt it more as it should have been supplemental. So like I would get together with friends and we would go through and they might be in a keto practitioner. We do some lax and this and that. And even in you know, the Taekwondo school, I mean, like, honestly, you don't know what's Taekwondo, what's not anymore almost because like the self-defense moves, well, is that really hop keto or is that really this or that? So I guess my original blend of Taekwondo mixed in other stuff too. Right. Yeah. And then um, what happened was I said, I should learn a weapon. So I, I remember saying, like, I should learn a weapon. So uh, nunchucks, they look cool, not very practical. I go, uh, scream of sticks. I got to learn this. 
So I, I think it was late 1999, I um, signed up for a weekend camp um, in Anayan, Kadena de Mano. I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was a scream. I'm like, I can't wait. So I, I go to this weekend with my scream stick. And I was really fortunate in Wisconsin. Um, I had networked with these wonderful group of school owners. And then our main guy, Mr. Shinnebeck, is like a, this unknown who is just a phenomenal person. He introduced us to all these different instructors. Well, anyway, I, I end up at this, this camp and we're like, I'm like three hours in. And we're doing a knife drill, and we're literally doing angle one, step forward, angle one, step back, and block. Step forward, angle one, step back, block. And then we would parry. And then we would cut. We would just evade and cut. And then we would block cut. And we would parry cut. And I'm like, I'm, I go, Mr. Shinnebeck, Mr. Shinnebeck, when are we going to do the stick? And he looks at me like I was crazy. He goes, there's no sticks in Gandino. This is going to be an empty hand and knife style. I looked at him. My eye, I, I almost started crying. I'm a grown man. You know, 20, 20, you know, how old was I at the time? 20, uh, 24 years old, ready to cry because we weren't going to do sticks this week. I spent all this money. And then by the end of the weekend, I was hooked. Uh, we were doing these interactive knife flow drills and um, we weren't even doing this time, but we we're just doing all these different coordination drills. I'm like, where's this been my whole life? And it felt like the next step because in the Taekwondo program, we were already doing, um, you know, in our one steps, we weren't just blocking. We were doing basically parries, you know, different types of movements was already part of that from my old school already. It was like taking that and putting it on steroids. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I remember distinctly. Um, and that's, and then from there, I never looked back. And just kept going and going and going, you know. And how about the jujitsu? Oh, yeah. So um, uh, through Mr. Cinnabak as well, um, Mike and A, who brought uh, Screamer to Wisconsin, brought Russ Rhodes along to train a little bit. Now, I, I just want to take a, I know in some of your podcasts, like, oh, name drop. You know what? If I mention someone's name, it's because I'm so proud of, like, these individuals. <laughs> and if it wasn't, for them, man, we wouldn't be here. Um, these these guys are absolutely incredible. But they brought out Russ Rhodes, and what would happen was um, uh, Mike and A would do the, the 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 Filipino entries, you know, all that the hand stuff, maybe into a lock, maybe not, and then Russ Rhodes would take it and turn it into throw five different throws and takedowns and stuff on the ground and this kind of and it and it just blended seamlessly. And then they started an instructor program in the Dons and Rue. And uh, I've been doing that ever since as well. You know? mm. so, cool. Yeah, it's a fun little marriage. One of the things I like about cross training, and you know, even, even if it's just for a couple hours, you know, going to a seminar or something, is that quite often it will not change. It, that's too strong a word, but maybe adjust the way I look at the things that I do as my core martial arts did you have any of those experiences did the did the escrima change the taekwondo did the jujitsu change the escrima and, and the taekwondo in the way you saw it or maybe practiced it yeah definitely in the way you practiced it and then definitely like the exploration i feel like you know the, the teaching methodology in filipino martial arts is i think is like holy cow the way they take it from you know, here's a technique to a drill, to the reflexive training, the stress training, the fighting. Like there is a process. You know, you didn't go from here's a technique now go now now go fight. You know, there's this whole process there. Then I also feel like that that training methodology has definitely influenced everything else. But then I also feel like it opens a door. All of a sudden, you open this door, and then outside that door, there's 50 more doors. And like for me, like sometimes one concept, I wish I could think of an example right now, but it would change like 50 other things, like it was just, just a little bit, you know, and that is the coolest thing, you know, because at this point, you know, if you've been doing martial arts your whole life, you know, in, in cross training, there's not like, okay, here's this new secret move you're going to learn. 
It's more like these little pieces, these little nuances, maybe a little bit of footwork or, you know, just one change in direction and all of a sudden, you know, influences everything else, you know? Yeah. Do you, and and this might be an unfair question because I don't know if I could answer it. Uh, Do you remember any of those nuances? Is there one that you might be able to share? Yeah, that's the challenge, right? Because they're so small and, and in the moment it's, you know, it blows your mind up. But then for me, it just becomes part of the way I see it. And it's hard to remember how I used to see it. Yep. I'll, I'll give you a, an example. So um, there's something called a lock flow one in a nine. And what it is, is um, it's a back and forth with locks. It's, it's a form originally, so you can learn a series of locks and then how to counter them. So what happens, I'll put you in lock one. You counter it because every lock has a, a way out, right? You got a falcon and base or a lever. So you get out of the lock, you put me in lock two. I'll get out of that lock and go to lock three. So you learn this whole form, right? Mm. So once you learn these, you know, a series, let's say it's 11 locks, you got to do it right side, you got to do it left side. But then you should be able to um, enter every one of those 11 locks from a straight across wrist grab. So how do I get there from a straight across? How do I go to lock number four from this position, right? Um, another example would be instead of doing the locks back and forth, how do I transition doing them all in order? So instead of me doing lock number one, you do lock number two. I do lock number one, you counter, and I transition to lock two. Then I transition to lock three. and So it's a one direction lock. Then you look at every lock and you go, well, what takedowns can I do from this one lock? So all you do is you look at the first lock, you get four takedowns. And then you look at the second lock. Well, how many ways can I do this? And then you, then you, you, you give your students this challenge. And all of a sudden, they say, I didn't see that. Holy cow. Then you take that same lock flow, and you do it against a wall. So now you're on the wall. Now you have this lock. So now how can I use this basically fixed weapon to man- manipulate them so I throw them into the wall? <laughs> Um, as part of it, or as they get taken down, their takedown, they hit the wall halfway through their takedown, and now they're in this precarious situation or a hallway, and then do the same lock flow on the floor. You know, it's like, holy moly, right? So, you know, that one concept opens up, you know, 50 new, uh, you know, an unlimited number of techniques. So then you look at anything else that way. You look at a disarm. And you say, well, I should be able to do this disarm. How do I get there from any one of these positions? And so on and so forth. You know, so that's that is probably the best example I can think of. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. I can see that. And I suspect a lot of the people listening have had, you know, similar moments. I, I, th- I think we quite often, as we're training in the early days, we're looking for those those big secrets, those shortcuts. Oh, if I, if I go train this art or I go train under this person, I go to this seminar, I learn this, this movement, then I'm going to be that much better, you know, leapfrog everyone else. It's, it's almost like out of a old Kung Fu movie, you know, you're, you're, they're expecting that there's going to be some super secret, you know, dim mock death touch kind huh. of thing that, that we're, we're going to learn, <laughs> but you get a few years in and you learn that it's all these really, really small increments that in and of themselves, maybe, maybe they're not terribly valuable, but because you've done those other 40, 50, 60 hours on the thing preceding it, now it becomes 1% better and then 1% better. And then maybe on a really good day, it's one and a half percent better. And that's really what training is. Absolutely. It's, it's fun, you know, like, I have not lost the desire to keep growing and learning. You know, it's, it's weird. I keep thinking, when, when am I going to stop? Or what am I not going to want to do this? Or what am I going to be just happy? I'll, I'll just be happy here running a school and teaching and mentoring other instructors and stuff. But it's never, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> mm. Well, I'm going to guess, just the way you've talked about this, is that you have to keep developing new skills. You know, you have to develop new skills to open the school. And then 
you talked about bringing on staff. And now you just use the phrase mentoring instructors, you know, so unless you started out with all those skills and you were really, really lucky, you've had to keep oh. getting better. Am, am I right? Oh my God. Yeah. Yep. So Lots if we, of mistakes along the way. Yep. Would you mind talking about some of those? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. I, I remember probably the biggest thing is, you know, the hard, the old hard mean way of teaching, you know, you know if you think of the Cobra Kai, you know, dishing out push-ups, bossing people around. I mean, I, I remember this one mistake I made in class. I and I and I was came from the right place. Like I did not mean anything any harm. But you know, we you know, it was a kid's class and this one kid was teasing another kid and I and I wasn't sure and it wouldn't stop and I didn't know how to handle it. So and I and I was right in front of me. He made he kind of made made fun of this other student in class. And I said, all right, man, show me your kicking combination. He showed me his kicking combination. I looked at this kid. This kid's 11 years old. And, I, and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm in college. And I looked at him. I go, oh, yeah? When you do your combination, you look like a monkey. You look like a monkey. Your arms are flopping around everywhere. Not, nah, not, nah, not, nah, not, nah, not. Nah. Here I am in front of, you know, 30 people and their parents, you know, making fun of this kid that didn't, you know, that didn't really deserve it. He didn't mean it. Oh, the kids started crying. I felt awful. I learned my lesson right then and there. <laughs> you know, it was just one. I thought I was doing the right thing. Like, oh yeah, he's gonna learn how much this thinks. He'll never make fun of anybody. And maybe it did work. <laughs> um, I mean, I didn't have any real fallout because people knew I was from a good place, and their and the kid's parent was right there, and I'm like freaking out. I'm apologizing. I'm so sorry I did that. Just like it's okay. I understand. <laughs> but yeah, that was a big one. Yeah. That was a big mistake there. You know, that could be tough. And I think that that for me. And just based on the schools that I've watched, it's really hard when you've got that situation where something's going on right in that moment and you have to respond to that right in that moment. But yeah. handling it with all of the, the grace that it needs to be handled, but knowing that the way you discipline that kid impacts the way the kid that was getting picked on is going to feel and the way everyone else around is going to react. And that sets a tone for later on. And I don't know about you, but I don't think there's a, a right answer. I think they're all wrong to varying degrees. And you just got to pick the one that seems the least wrong in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the biggest teaching tools are going to be, you know, influence over authority. You know, rather than bossing people, you tell them what you want, not what not to do. You know, just just the you know po using positivity, you know, is, is the number one thing. You got a kid that, you know, you want them to stand up strong and tall on their knee, and the kid next to him is spinning around. Well, the one that's instead of saying stop spinning around, come on, knock it off, Johnny. You go to the one sitting tall next to him. Say, Man, I love how I love how Julie's sitting up nice and tall. And he's oh wow, good job, Johnny. You know, and you you kind of like I I find that is the best way to do that. And um, when I made that that change, it happened kind of naturally. But once I like saw it on paper and like, you know, you learn this. Wait, this is an actual teaching tool. Like, oh my God, you start applying it, and then you see the results you get. You know, now there there definitely is times when you have to raise your voice, put your foot down. But you know, each class is different. You know, you're teaching your little dragons, your five and six year olds. You know, and then you got your basics, kids who are in it for one year, your next program. And then my next program, I got kids who've been in there, you know, they're, they're, they're seven to 12 and they're anywhere from one year to five years of training. In that class, I have rapport with them. And if they've been training for three years, I can raise my voice and say, knock it off. And it'll, it'll work. But not for that, you know, yellow belt who's been with you for six months. You know, that's not with them. You know, to keep being a positive, you know, and even in that intermediate advanced class, we're still 90% positive. But then every so often, we got to turn the screws down, you know, and kind of raise your voice. I hate doing it, but sometimes we have to, you know. For sure. For sure. I think of it kind of like a currency that they, you know, you get time with them, you get time on the mat or the floor, whatever you call it, and you treat them well. 
and they start to trust you and you earn that currency. And you can spend that in a lot of different ways. You can spend it all at once if you've got it and yell and demand something and maybe they'll comply if, if you've got enough. There's enough you know, in the tank to spend it on that. But I, I've learned, like, I've got to be really careful how much of that I try to spend. You know, if I burn it all out at the beginning of class, I've got nothing for the last 15 minutes. They're not going to pay attention to me. They're not going to listen. I already asked them too much. I've emptied the tank. Yeah, that's a really good uh, analogy. I'm going to, I'm going to use that. I'm right now. Right now. <laughs> Steal it. I don't, yep. I, I don't, I don't think that was mine. I mean, for all I know it was, but uh, it doesn't sound, you know, I'm not, I'm not taking, taking credit for it, you know, I, right. and I've, I've extended that, that out, you know, that anytime I'm working with a person or a group, you know, you, you've got that, that personal capital that you get to develop. And, and once I realized that, you know, I spent a lot more time trying to develop the capital, trying to, you know, mine that currency with people. And, you know, the, yeah. uh, the good irony out of that is that, that's all good stuff you should be doing anyway. Yeah. Now, if you now were to go back to you then, let's say day one on opening your school, you know, it's all, it's shiny and, and you're there and you've put all that time and all that money into it. What advice would you give? You know, let's say, let's say you got to sit down you quite often I'll ask this question is, you know, like what, what's the one thing or whatever. But let's let's open it up a little bit more general. Let's say you had a time machine, you could go back for twenty minutes, and you got to sit down with yourself. What, what would you be talking about? What would you be sharing? Well, I was lucky in that it was many many years in the making, and I had some colleagues and friends who had already made the leap, and I was lucky. I had a bunch of people, you know, guide me and help me. And, you know, the, the martial art industry association was, you know, they had their magazine, you know, there, there was actually resources out there. Um, I was a huge, uh, huge fan of uh, Dave Kovar because um, he's well known in the martial art industry, but yeah, what he struck me really well because he's like, you're a martial artist first teacher second, business the man third, but you absolutely, it's its not like the part, you can't neglect the business part, you have to have, but it was more like he emphasized, like, don't sacrifice your values, don't sacrifice your, you know, who you are, your program, you know, like, you know, be passionate about all that stuff, but you, you still have to pay the bills, so you got to make this work, so I was really lucky um, with that, but some of the biggest things I think um, that I did that really helped, and I would tell anybody else to do like one of the best advice I got was get a get a tuition company from day one. Um, you might think this is an expense you can't afford, but man, collecting money from your students, um, you know, having them pay you by the fifth of every month is just, or however you're going to do it, is so hard. Um, where if you hire a, a, a nice, you know, management. Co- company they, they, they handle all that for you um you know you know if they're late um if they're eventually you might have to call them or whatever but there, there are programs now that that um you know you set up an automatic email and automatic text hey guys we missed your payment if you need to here's a link to update your card um that saves you even if you have a small school you know because when you have a small school you got to be investing like how am i going to get this next how am i going to get the new crop of students in You know, what is my best class schedule? What is this? You know, getting out there and meeting people, running events. If you're spending your time because five people are late on their tuition, oh my God, you know, that, that, that is just, just killing us. So that's one of the biggest things Mm. is, um, you know, start that, uh, you know, use that billing company to help you out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things we've, you know, sorry, no, go ahead. One of the things that we've we've gone into, I can't even tell you how many times on the show, is this notion of teaching as a business or martial arts as a business versus martial arts, you know, as a, we'll just say free, free programs. And I think both work. What I think doesn't work is when people try to ride the middle. Mm. 
you know, this is this is a business, but I don't want to be I don't want to be really business like about it. And well, in my observation, it just it, it doesn't work to ride the middle. You know, you, you send a signal to your your students that, yeah, I have this rule that you have to pay me, but I'm not going to I'm not going to enforce it. And I've got this rule that, you know, you have to show up on time, but I'm not going to enforce it. And how do they how to how are they able to differentiate between those rules and then the rules that you have when they step out and, and it's within class? You know, are they really going to draw that different of a line? Yeah, I agree. So what's it's, your truth? Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I, it's a hard balance to, you know, so when you look at schools, right, you got like, uh, you could say people that maybe uh, sell out, uh, you, you might, you might think they're selling out. And at that school, you could be a black belt in 24 to 30 months. And then the other hand, you have, you know, they have, you know, 300 students. Then you have another school that it's basically like a Mr. Miyagi. And he's got four people in the basement. And it takes 10 years to get your black belt, right? Well, there's two different ends of the spectrum, right? If it takes you 10 years, well, obviously you're going to be, I mean, that person is going to be amazing if opposed to, you know, regardless of, you know, how good the instruction is in two and a half years, that's not going to be the same, you know, standard, right? And uh, so, so it's like, okay, well, how do I, how do you do this, right? So, so for me, what I was able to kind of, I, I kind of set myself in the middle. So if Taekwondo is my core program, you know, for me, that's about a five-year program. You know, it might be able to be done slightly after. It might take six years. But that's roughly, if you come consistently and you put in the work, you know, there's never a guarantee. But if you put in the work, you do it's about five years, right? So I found that's like a happy middle. And um, uh, I, I'm, I'm lucky. Like, I talked to some of my colleagues. And uh, in the early ranks for Taekwondo, one of the retention tools is getting a new belt. Like, if you get a new belt, you're excited. You're not going to quit anytime soon, right? So for me, in the in the early stages, they test about once every quarter. But then once they're in the intermediate and advanced, I only offer it twice a year. It's every six months. Into a green belt, that seems like forever. But I explain this to the parents. We explain it to the students, and this is the way it is. And, and some people they just can't believe that I have a successful business, and I can make this longer time period to it. You know, but I just got, you know, you just got lucky and you can do it. You know, a lot of people think you're crazy. And all you got to test every two months, you know, that way they won't quit. You know, I don't know how I got off on that tangent. <laughs> Sorry about <laughs> there that. There are no tangents on martial arts radio. It's all <laughs> oh, relevant. It's God. all good. We, we wander, we wander, you know, mm-hmm. of all the things that I worried about when I started the show, <laughs> the one that I did not worry about was whether or not the martial artists that I would have on would be able to fill the time because I've never trained under anyone who couldn't talk the whole class. If, uh, if we, if we kind of poked him at the right, in the right moment, I, I've gotten oh, kind of good at that. Yeah. I, uh, I, I have some friends that are probably listening who, who will know who I'm talking about. So I'm not going to mention which instructor this is, but you know, if he's running us really hard, all I have to do is, is, you know, there are a couple subjects I could just mention with like three or four words and he'll tell us a story. Get time to cool oh, that's off. hilarious. I've done that. <laughs> I've done that. Oh God, that's great. Yeah. I love it. Mm. One of the, the challenges that we hear from people is that when they have their own school and they're running that business, that their own training suffers. Is that, is that true for you? It does. It kind of goes in waves hmm. and you have to accept it um, because maybe you're not physically, you know, getting the reps in on your form or on your sidekick, but hopefully you're watching your students and you're playing with different ways of breaking it down and explaining it. I, I remember you know, you're just teaching a class and you're teaching this turn, you know, to your yellow belts and you you phrase it differently then all of a sudden it works and then um and then a lot of times um you'll explain something to somebody in a way where it reinforces in your brain and it's making you better you know so even though you are getting your reps in it's 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 all right you're still growing you're still learning and and um 
um, I just take it in waves now. There's times when I, I get the reps, and there's some times when I'm doing more teaching, but that's okay, you know. Uh, I you definitely have to separate training from teaching. So, for example, if I'm teaching class and I'm like focused on my workout and my pattern, my I, I'm not giving my students like you should be. So it's really important that you know if you're teaching, you're teaching. Now, in my black belt class, um, depending on who's there, and we're running through mitt drills or whatever stuff, I'll definitely get some reps in with with someone. Um, that way, and then in my advanced scrimmage class, that's really my time to train because everybody is kind of at a level now where they don't need as much hands on, they just need a, 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 a like a director just to point them in the right direction. And, and you know, you know, here and you know, they don't need as much uh attention. But other than that, I have to get together with my training partners, my instructors. You know, I, I have to do it more, I have to dedicate separate time to it. And we just stumbled on something that I think is really important. I don't know that we've talked about it. Here we are coming up mm. on 500 episodes. I don't know that we've talked about this. So uh, mm. forgive me to to listeners if we have, and I'm just spacing. The idea of stepping in and training with your students. That's something that I, I'm not going to say most will or most won't, but I, I know a lot of instructors who absolutely will not train side by side with their students. They won't spar with their students. Mm. You know, they, they, they almost hide. Mm. And you're talking about it in a, um, what almost seems like a casual way that this is not a big deal in your school, that you're happy to jump in and, and train right alongside them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the, the, the big, especially when there's seminars, I can bring in guest instructors, we go train and heck, I'm, I'm partnering with my, you know, working with, you know, my people, but if I'm, um, I guess the, the biggest point, if I'm teaching most classes, I'm just teaching, you know, there's only a couple classes where I'm going to be, you know, and I get to work in with them too. I mean, sparring, that's a whole different story. You know, it's Taekwondo class and I'm in the mood to spar. I'm in my forties now. So depending on the day and the, how the joints feel and what I did earlier that day, I might not be up for sparring, <laughs> <laughs> but when I'm up for it, it's definitely a good time. And I think one word you just used in the way you were talking about that says a a lot about you it tells us a lot about you and your approach to teaching and training you said get to you get to step in with them you don't have to you don't need to it's not you know there's a there's an odd number so now you're going to step in and even it out you get to mm -hmm. do, do you feel like you're how do, how do i ask this i'm going to speculate mm -hmm. that you're not tired of any of this that you get up in the morning and feel like hey this is great like i get to do this 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 i'm lucky that this is part of my life the majority majority yes and i appreciate the honesty i i yes but i do get burnt out mm. there is times when i am burnt out ask my staff <laughs> Um, but that's very short lived. It's not because of lack of passion or in, enjoying it or wanting to do it. It's just like I am exhausted, um, and I need a break. And and uh, you know I'm so fortunate where you know I with the school I, I have to I have to pinch myself sometimes. If you would have told me, I'd be where where I was at. You know when I was going to own a school someday, I, my dream was to have a hundred students pay, and, and, and pay the bills and, you know, make $40,000 a year. And that would be it. That was my dream. You know, um, if you would have said you have a full-time school, you have seven employees, nearly 300 students. Um, you know, I'm at the point now where some nights I'm like the principal where I'm not even, a, I, I have such a good staff member, some instructors where, my challenge now is, is there's times when I want to teach, but I actually shouldn't because it's not my time. It's their time. They're, they're paid to, to teach and they want to teach and they're really, really good at it. You know, and it's for me to come in there because they've been thinking all day about their lesson plan and what they're going to do. And I come in here, oh yeah, I'm going to teach. I'm going to teach 615 class. My guy's that cool. You know, I actually feel bad sometimes 
a lot of times they welcome it like, oh, great, Mr. Percy. All right, cool. We're getting him on a mat for this class. We don't normally have him on a mat. It's great. But, you know, there's other times when I'm, you know, I, I, I feel bad. So there's this weird balance of, okay, yes, I'm still the, you know, I'm the owner and I'm an instructor, but I have all these other wonderful instructors as well. So it's like a challenge. Like, oh, when do I teach or not teach? And then, you know, a lot of times I'll be the assistant instructor. I've been doing that a lot lately. They're running the class, and then I'm just one of the assistants running a line or taking group forms or whatever. But it's such a interesting thing, and I'm, I almost hired myself out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> almost. But it's a good problem, you know. That's a, that's a but no, great I mean, problem. I'll have to be honest with you, you know, like I was burnt out last night and i have a on wednesday nights i have a separate adult class and adult flat book class and it was a smaller group and it was the weather it was just an unusual night smaller classes and i wasn't feeling it i, I looked at my staff and said hey guys w- w- would it be all right if we combine class night and make it make it a general taekwondo class you guys run it he said absolutely sir we got it and i just i just got to take a load off for for, for that class you know and that happens, you know, and I feel guilty sometimes. Like, I feel like I'm letting people down or, or, or hurting people, but you can't do everything all the time. Not hurting people, but, you know, disappointing that oh, I wasn't on the floor for that class. But what are you going to do? You know, I, 30 classes a week in the school. Wow. That's a lot of classes, you know. Wow. How many of those do you teach? Uh, right now, always six or seven, probably, but it could be 15. I mean, it always, it depends, man. I, um, it depends on the week. There's so many moving parts now. Yeah. Um, I just had a crazy weekend. Um, we do these after-school programs for uh, the local schools, and they're a fundraiser. And we had a record number. I mean, it's wow. almost a problem. We enrolled 28 <laughs> students over the weekend. That's 20, amazing. It, it is amazing. And it's never happened before. And it's like, oh my God. And it came at a good time because, you know, things go up and down. And, you know, so it's a, it's a nice bump. You know, it's not going to transform the school really, but it's really nice. But these people are coming in. I don't know who they are yet. So I'm like, I'm, I'm making sure extra staff members. So I've been literally the host the last couple nights. You know, I have my, I have my office manager doing welcome meetings. My instructor's running class. And I'm like trying to meet people at the door, helping them tie their belts. and. You know, showing them how to check in and say hi to the parents. Say, hey, sorry, I won't, we won't get to do our meeting tonight, but we'll get to you the next week or two. And, you know, it's just a weird thing. Well, then I'm not, on, I'm not teaching, you know. So it's like, ah. But you got to learn to go with the flow and not beat, beat myself up over it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've yeah. noticed that in business, not just in martial arts, but in business, people either hold themselves to really high standards that they can never meet, at least not sustainably. Mm-hmm. Or they hold themselves to fairly low standards, mm-hmm. and you know they're always at them. You know, and and reaching for really high standards is good because you you push and and things get better and there's improvement, but there's a lot of burnout. And yet the other way, maybe things don't progress, at least not as much, but it can be a little more satisfying, and what I find really interesting about this dichotomy when I, when I look at the people that I'm thinking about as I'm talking about this is that they're just wired one way or the other. There's no right way or wrong way. And, and I'm, I'm aware that the words I'm using probably make it sound like I'm, I'm being judgmental. I'm certainly wired for the former. You know, I'm always pushing. I'm always looking for what's next, bigger, more, and rarely satisfied. And it can be really frustrating and <laughs> exhausting. I mean, you're talking about some of that too. I think you're probably, we're probably similar in that way. But then I see other people who are wired the other way, and they tend to be a lot happier. Yeah, I like the way you word it. I like the way you you, you know you take you have a nice way of um, taking thoughts and then uh, processing it and then putting it into words. I like that. Thank you. It comes from uh, growing up a single child and spending a lot of time as a nerd by himself reading a lot of books. There you go. <laughs> I got really good at having conversations with myself. Sure. You mentioned earlier on in, in the conversation about some of the wonderful people who have supported you as you've gone on and, and the advice colleagues and training partners. And if you had to pick one of those people and say, you know, 
this person contributed the biggest core, the biggest chunk of who I am as a martial artist today, who would that be? Yeah, I'd have to say, uh, uh, and he's done this for a lot of people, uh, Kevin Shutterback out of, out of out of Wisconsin here. He's, he's in Green Bay and uh, uh, just kind of an under-the-radar under radar phenomenal martial artist, cross trains, and he's just, you know, such a good person. And if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have been exposed to, you know, these other arts. And uh, he's always giving of his time. And, you know, I, I could... I can call him up tomorrow and say, "Hey, man, I want I want to come get a private lesson." He's like, "Yes, sir." It was, you know, he'd be just giving person and just mm -hmm. uh, phenomenally good martial artist and, and just just humble as can be. And uh, man, I, I know in in Wisconsin, our group all really look up look up to him. You know, he's just uh, very well loved and respected. And, and uh, yeah, I have to really you know appreciate that. You know? That's great, and. The more we do these shows, the more we get to hear about people like that who, uh, and, and I don't mean this in a negative way, the, the world's never going to know who they are. They're not famous. They have no desire for being in the limelight. They're never going to have a YouTube channel. And a lot of them say no when we invite them to come on this show. They love martial arts. They love teaching. They love training. And they just want to be part of it and share what they've learned. Sounds like he's one of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, the world would be better if we had more people like that. I think. No, yep. no. Yep. And if I could mention that the the second person would be uh, uh, Jason Jason and May. Um, he inherited the Anayan system from his father Mike, and I I I never knew Mike. Um, I had like one training seminar with him, that one I talked about earlier, and yeah. but I was like just in the corners. I I didn't I wasn't going to say hi. I didn't. I just hung out there and, and Mike passed like the, a couple months later and I didn't mm. know I wasn't in the circle yet. Mm. You know, I wasn't in the circle of these people. And then the next uh, training segment weekend training came in and Jason came in his behalf and I didn't know what was going on. I was so scared. Like what happened to Mike? I didn't ask. Mm. I went through the whole weekend and then I got to know um, Jason and they really well. And, 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 um, uh, he's, as far as my development personally, as a martial artist, like growing and becoming a martial artist, he has, he's just unreal the way he presents things and thinks about things and teaches and works with people and his methodology. Um, he's had a huge, uh, you know, changed everything the way I look at martial arts, you know. And he, he's had a, you know, um, a rough time. You know, he lost his father when he was, you know, you know, fairly young, you know, in his 20s. And, you know, he had to take over the system from his dad. And that's not an easy thing to do. And now he has this responsibility to travel the world and, uh, you know, carry on the system. And, and but I just I just wanted to mention that because you say, you yeah. know, who's influenced you the most? I couldn't not mention those two people. You know? And obviously there's many more of course those yeah it, it i mean that that cliche it takes a village i mean we're all we're all who we are as martial artists today because of a lot of people whether they were people who showed up for one class and mm. you said one word or you know work that one drill you know it mm -hmm. might not be a big contribution but you know the desert's made up a lot of grains grains of sand you know yeah. and, and which one of them is most important you know it's not really something you can say. Let's flip that question on its head. If you could add someone to that list, somebody that you haven't had the chance to train with or under, who would that be? Oh, um, yeah. I, I, someone I haven't trained with that I uh, wish I could or would have would be, uh, would be Jason's dad, Mike, because you know, I had that one summer with him, but it was basic, and I didn't have any one-on-one -on -one with him. But uh, when people talk about uh, the kind of person he was, the way he connected with people, and the way he taught, and and all this stuff, but it would it would definitely have been uh, uh, Maggie Shrew, Mike and A. He'd be the one person 
that mm. uh, I would like to train with. But didn't mm. get a chance to, you know. Yeah. yeah. He passed away um, a heart attack while he was teaching. Uh. You know, in his, in his, I believe he was in his late fifties when that happened. You know, it was like no one expected it. It was just, just happened. You know. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a shame. It's a shame. Yeah. You know, in, in whether it's martial arts or or anywhere else, you know, we're we see people who are doing great things and they pass too soon, and and I don't think there's anything you can do other than recognize that that's possible and just treasure what you have. Treasure the people, treasure the time. What about the future? When you when you look out over the horizon, you know, however far out you want to think of that, what's coming? What are you hoping for? What are you working towards? Mm. Yeah, I guess from the martial arts standpoint, I'm really happy with how the school's doing. Um, my biggest thing is um, I want to grow my adult program and i have a really strong adult program so if you look at most full-time schools you know with 200 or more students you're talking usually they're um you know when you think of traditional arts 90 percent kids if not more um you know so you have 200 students you got maybe 20 adults training um i have a pretty good number i might be i should i don't know the exact number but let's say i'm at 25 percent adults, which is you know a nice number you know i have yeah. nice classes you know 10 20 25 people in class it's great um but i want to bring it to more adults my 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 frustration is that yes thank you karate kid thank you power rangers thank you all that stuff people see it as something just kids do but in reality it was never designed for that you know the, the you know the traditional martial arts it's an adult activity that we let kids do so um the last couple of years i've been trying to be more creative with um reaching more adults you know like yeah they want to do kickboxing and they want to do brazilian jiu-jitsu and they want to do mma hey that stuff is wonderful but there's this other side of traditional martial arts that you know not only is it good for kids but it's good for you guys you're going to get some exercise you're going to reduce your stress you're going to work your mind in different ways you're going to have the reward of learning a new skill. You're going to make more friends. It's, I mean, it's for adults. It's, it's unbelievable. So um, it's really hard, though, to get someone who's never thought of it ever, never considered it, to, to actually wear a uniform, wear a belt, come in and start in this weird foreign activity that you only think kids do. So I've been really, um, um uh doing some things to, to to really grow the adult market and it's 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 slow but it's 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 working you know um so that's probably my one that's my one main goal and then my other goal is um i have this little i'll call it hobby business and of course it's still martial art related <laughs> um i call it a hobby business because so much time has been put into it and it's not I mean, the revenue that's generated from it is, you know, nothing substantial, but it's a little something. And I have a little thing where um, uh, it's a way for people to grow in their martial arts as like a school owner or an instructor. And it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's online and then with me, but it's a, um, like a distance learning program. And right now I have like 17 uh, people in it, and it's really it's people I know, you know, they're they're school owners I've met across the country, and then what happens is um, it's the curriculum's all laid out for them, and there are videos where um, uh, you know a lot of Filipino martial art programs are wonderful, but a lot of them lack structure, and the Anayan program is really structured, but then I kind of took it, you know, and, and add a little flavor to it, and then made videos for everything. And um, um, I really enjoy working with school owners because you take someone who's been doing martial arts for 25, 30 years, and all of a sudden you show them um, a Filipino hand drill or stick drill, and you watch their eyes pop out of their head and jaw hit the floor and get all excited. 
And like, okay, well, here's another jump. Like, oh my God, oh my God. And you're like little kid white belts again. That is the most rewarding thing in the world. So, um, I, like I said, I have this little hobby business that, you know, I wouldn't mind growing, you know, to, um, you know, maybe doubling, you know, get 30, 40 members in it. I think that'd be awesome. Mm-hmm. And um, it's really cool because most of these people that are in the program now, they have a Taekwondo background. So I, sh- I have this shared knowledge and experience. And then to be able to take that and transition to it into these other areas um, is really, really cool. So I guess that's what's on the horizon for me. That was a really long answer. <laughs> no, that, that was not even close to a long answer oh in the God, context I'm of this show. Like, God, like, <laughs> well, this guy, well, this guy, I'm shut up. <laughs> um, uh, the record for one episode is two and a half hours. We split it in two parts. So well, you're not even close. You're not even close. If people want to reach you, they want to find you online, website, social media, any of that, where would they go? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm on Facebook. Sorry, I have not joined the Twitter world and Instagram. I probably should. Yeah, don't you can find me, Pete Sorcy. I'm on Facebook. It's just, I don't know, that's one social media thing is enough for me. And then uh, the website for my school is uh, sorcymartialarts.com. And then the website for that other program I talked about is Sorcy Training Systems. Um, the Sorcy Training Systems, there's not a way to subscribe or anything like that. It's it, it has a few things or some information, um, but it's it's literally people, you know, we get to know it's a personal thing. You know, if people are interested, you can reach out. And then, um, you know, you can't just go to the website and sign up for it. It's, it's more mm, casual. It's more for people that you, know, you get to know a little bit and they really want to learn it. They can, you know, we can go down that avenue if they wish. But it's not like a big... Um, Go to this website and sign up now for you know, not like that <laughs> kind of thing, and, and that stuff's great too. And maybe I will do that someday. You never know. But as of right now, that's not where I'm at. <laughs> it, it can all work when done the right time for the right people. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. This has been a lot of fun, and I'd like to give you the chance to send us out in whatever way feels most appropriate. What parting words, advice, wisdom, you name it, would you want to leave the listeners with today? Oh man. Well, I knew that question was coming. <laughs> um, I guess the thing is, is oh, you got to stay passionate. You know, you got to just, you got to work at it too. You got to work at it. It's like a relationship. If you think about someone you fall in love with, you know, in the beginning, you're excited and you, and you, you just, you're not sure yet, but you just know you want to get to know more about them. It's kind of like the same thing with the martial arts in the beginning. I'm not sure, but I like this. I want to do more classes. And then over time, um, you start to grow in love. You fall in love with this person. But then as it grows, you gotta uh, you got to make time and effort. you got to be on the same page. you got to work at, um, you know, spending time with your, you know, your significant other. You have to, your family. You have to make time for that. So same thing, like with your martial arts, you got to do this. You have to do the work to stay passionate. You got to continue to talk to people. You got to read. You got to look at videos. You got to go take a seminar. You got to, you got to put the work in um, to stay passionate. So I guess that's the, when I would be my closing thoughts there. I've heard people say that one of the best ways to know another martial artist is to train with them or to spar with them. I think we can get a pretty good idea who someone is by talking to them here on martial arts radio. And that's how I'm leaving today. I feel like I got a great understanding of who this man is. And in case it wasn't obvious, I thoroughly enjoyed my time. I hope you did too. So thank you, sir. Hope to talk to you again soon. If you want more, head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where you'll find photos, videos, links, social media. And a lot more for this and every other episode we've ever done. If you're down to support us in all of our work, you have a number of options. Visit the store at whistlekick.com and use the code podcast15 to get 15% off. Or leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, or help out with our Patreon account. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. And remember, if you see someone out in the wild wearing a whistlekick shirt or a hat, make sure you say hello. We're building a community here and you are part of it, whether you want to be or not. Hopefully you want to be. 
If you have guest suggestions, I want to hear them. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and make sure you are following us at Whistlekick, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and some others that you probably don't even check on yourself. That's all for this episode. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Bye.